Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming, and uh, thanks to Ausweg for their very kind invitation. Uh, sorry for interrupting a very interesting panel discussion and for standing between you and another discussion, but please bear with me. Um, with this presentation, I wanted to give you uh, an overview of uh, starting with uh, uh, diamide insecticides, what they are, and then what are the activities that DuPont is engaged on to uh, address the, the problems caused by insecticide resistance. So very quickly, let me introduce to you the diamides. These are the currently available diamide insecticides. They can be very distinct chemically. There are the phthalic and the anthranilic diamides. I will not go into the details of that, but uh, ultimately they all share what we call their target site. And that target site is the ryanodine receptor, which is, if you can imagine, a sort of gate that controls the movement of calcium uh, from within to outside the cell and, and vice versa. The ryanodine receptors got their name from ryanodine, which is a product that was actually used as an insecticide in older days, and it's extracted from a plant in the tropical Americas. Uh, but uh, diamides, what they do, and this slide will show their mode of action, they bind to that ryanodine receptor and keep it open, meaning that the calcium that's stored inside the cell moves out and the calcium is very important for a large number of cell processes, including muscle movement, as is represented here. And so the insects, uh, when they ingest diamide insecticides, they become lethargic, they stop feeding, and eventually they die. That's the basis for, for the activity of diamides. Because uh, diamides uh, bind to the ryanodine receptor, but they are not actually ryanodine, they are one of their most important properties is that they are very selective towards insects. Uh, um, diamides bind very strongly to insect ryanodine receptors, but not to the mammal ryanodine receptors. And that's what you can see here, represented with, by those cor curves, which is the differential, uh, differential in binding affinity between uh, ryanodine between diamides and different ryanodine receptors. Um, ryanodine, curiously, is very used in, in uh, mammal medical research. Uh, this also causes, this selectivity causes diamides to be very selective in, in terms of uh, their environmental profile. Low impact for fish, birds, mammals, and bees, which is becoming very important uh, recently. And it's also selective for beneficial arthropods, and thus they have a very good fit within IPM programs. Uh, in terms of the spectrum of activity, uh, flubendiamide and chlorantronilipril have activity mostly on lepidopteran pests with some other species in other orders. Uh, newer diamides like cyanthronilipril, which is currently being launched, have a broader spectrum of activity, we call it cross-spectrum meaning that they um, are active not only on Lepidopterans, but also on several species of beetles, uh, of uh, white flies, for example, of, of dipteran leaf miners, and of thrips. Diamides are also very flexible in terms of their mode of application. They can be sprayed as any other foliar insecticide, but they can also be delivered to the soil via uh, um, in furrow application or drip uh, irrigation. They can also be used for nursery box treatments and for seed treatment. So it's not surprising that you see a proliferation of uh, brands worldwide. There are several companies that produce and sell diamides. Um, not all of these brands are available in the same market, but as you can tell, uh, diamides are becoming more and more important in the marketplace. Um, as a matter of fact, I got this uh, figure from a recent publication showing data, I believe from 2013, so relatively recent, and it shows that diamides are actually, in terms of sales, approaching the classic organophosphate uh, insecticides, and I believe that in recent years they will overcome uh, organophosphates to become one of the most important groups of insecticides available uh, at present. 
So what this means is that with this proliferation of uh, commercial brands and widespread adoption, there's also been a, a growth of illegal products. That's something that I wanted to talk to you briefly. You might wonder, what does that have to do with resistance? Well, it does have a lot to do with resistance in some countries of the world because uh, in our case, chlorantronilipro, in the case of DuPont, is be being uh, illegally produced, uh, mostly in China, if not all of it, and it's being sold under different, very different ways in different countries of the world. I'll be a little, a little bit more specific afterwards. Uh, so that is actually a problem for resistance management because, as you can imagine, sometimes people don't know what they're applying to their crops. This is a current picture of what's happening in terms of resistance to diamides. Um, it started early in, in Thailand, right when we were developing uh, chlorantronilipril, and it's, uh, there's been uh, resistance recorded in several countries around the world, as you can say, mostly uh, Southeast Asia and, and the diamondback moth, which all of you that grow brassica know the importance of this pest but also in other instances like rice stem borer in China and Indonesia, um, even uh, Liramiza leaf miners in, in the US. So you, you can tell that it's a widespread problem and, and really uh, it's, it's uh, uh, eliciting a very strong response on our part, which I will be talking to you later. So what did we do to fight uh, resistance? We started by uh, generating what we call a baseline susceptibility which is going into the crop areas, collecting insects, determining their susceptibility prior to having uh, insecticide being used on them. Also, we participated in the IRAC, um, which is the action, uh, Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, uh, which is a technical organization that uh, brings together most of, or at least the most important insecticide companies in the world. Um, we also started an anti-counterfeit uh, effort trying to prosecute the illegal producers of chlorantronilipril and also uh, started creating greater awareness within our own organization for the need for uh, be proactive in terms of resistance management. So this is baseline work. That's what I was talking to you about, looking at uh, susceptibility prior to insecticide use. And that's important because it allows us then to answer questions of whether is there really resistance or was it a problem with the method of application or, or something like that. Um, there are also some regions in the world that require this baseline work. One example is the European Union, where you have to show with your biological dossier, uh, biological data and a plan for resistance management. This also allows us to advocate the responsible use of the product with all the, the researchers that are involved in the project. So these are the examples of illegal products that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, they originate from China and they're sold Southeast Asia, well, China obviously, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, they're arriving to Southern Europe uh, recently. Actually, someone had the decency of calling this one New Corrigen, which maybe we'll take that up for a renewal project. But um, it's, it's very difficult because these products at least are fake. You know what they are trying to replicate. But there's a lot of chlorantonilipril being sold in products that don't mention chlorantonilipril. If you ever have BT that suddenly becomes very effective on white flies, you should suspect that there's something going on. And, uh, it's, it's really a big problem for resistance management because people that use those products do not know what they're applying and thus they cannot do the basic procedure for resistance management which is rotate products with different modes of action. Uh, this was an example of the, the brassica crop in, in Thailand that we had uh, first recorded the resistance. So this was 15 months after uh, flubendiamide was registered, so chlorantonipol was still in development. And you can see already that in this uh, uh, brassica crop, diamondback moth was already pretty much uh, um, doing their thing without regard for the insecticide applications. So a little technical background on resistance. Uh, the, the cases that we have been characterized are mostly target site based, meaning uh, there are changes in the ryanodine receptor that make the insects not be affected by diamides. Basically, the diamide insecticides do not bind to the ryanodine receptor. 
Um, all the diamides are cross-resistant because they share the binding site. Uh, this uh, trait is recessive and uh, does not seem to have, or at least has a very low fitness cost, meaning that if it becomes prevalent in a population, it would be very difficult to eradicate it. Uh, and thus really gives us another incentive to be proactive and not let uh, resistance become prevalent. Um, another, uh, let's say, avenue for DuPont's influence in resistance management is our participation in IRAC International. Uh, as you can tell, maybe some of these logos are a bit outdated, but uh, there's a number of companies that participate in this organization. And uh, DuPont was instrumental in creating this Diamide Working Group, which uh, served to create the Diamide Resistance Guidelines and several other activities. Currently, it's been folded back into the Lepidopter Working Group, but a lot of work taking place in the Lepidopter Working Group is still related to Diamide uh, Resistance. Um, so the objective of that Diamide Working Group was to develop IRM strategies to prevent or delay the evolution of resistance. And uh, it, it basically it was identifying the most important uh, crops and pests in terms of resistance, which obviously diamondback moth was at the top. Educate the industry, making sure we all work together that we have a message that is not at odds with each other. Create country diamide working groups, and I think this was a very important development because it allowed people to develop those resistance, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> the resistance management strategies locally, which are much more effective if they would come from top down, from, from global. And, uh, and uh, those country groups were, have actually been very successful. There's over 20 of them worldwide. There's one in Australia doing very good work, now folded back with, with crop life. And they have developed a lot of uh, resistance guidelines locally. This uh, is supposed to represent the resistance guidelines. Uh, a very important activity is to include the, the mode of action it, uh, icon on the label and advocate for a window strategy in IRM. IRM. And that window strategy is supposed to represent the duration of one generation. And very succinctly, the, the, our proposed resistance management strategy is to not use the same mode of action from beginning to end of a crop. Use it for the duration of one generation, then switch to a different mode of action. Um, and that's what the windows approach is supposed to represent. If I could summarize this presentation in two, three words, it's rotate, rotate, rotate. That's your resistance management strategy. Uh, so use the, 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 the window strategy. That's what uh, I've just talked to you about. And uh, these are examples that doesn't, don't have to apply everywhere, but examples that come from different countries. And this was, was generated by the, the Philippines uh, Diamide Working Group with a rotation for control of diamondback moth. Uh, Iraq is also involved in training. I have, was fortunate enough to attend this training session also in the Philippines for what we call the trainers that will go then contact the, the growers themselves and spread the message of uh, the need to use this Windows approach and rotate modes of action. This is an example of one of those trainers that then went to the village and, and explained the, the, the resistant management strategy. We also work, this is an example from the US with what we call the influencers, which are uh, technical uh, extension personnel or university professors, and they will come up with resistance management strategies that are adapted to their local growing conditions. In this case is um, Brassicus II in, in Georgia, United States. Most of all, we are also trying to change a little bit the way resistance management is perceived within our own organization. And within DuPont, and I believe most other companies, IRM uh, is tend to, tends to be the responsibility of the R&D organization, but uh, which usually trains and devises those IRM strategies. But we believe that it, it goes beyond that, and it's really important to involve the rest of the organization, marketing and sales, because they tend to have very good access to growers, for example. And uh, it's really required their involvement for 
IRM to succeed. And that's what we've been trying to do within DuPont. We've been also trying to work with our colleagues to identify the most important markets in terms of, of uh, uh, risk of resistance. What we have here is an exercise that we conducted where we um, graphed the risk of resistance, for example, the presence of a very important pest or damaging pest, and our ability to mitigate the risk, the risk of resistance measured, for example, in terms of access to growers or presence of uh, influential uh, extension services. And thus, this allows us to select a number of markets, red is bad, green is good, uh, so that if we can then direct always uh, restricted uh, um, uh, dollars going for uh, resistance management. Also, we're trying within our organization to really make people uh, understand and aware of where resistance management fits in within our core values. So at DuPont, we have these four uh, core values, and we're trying to really make people aware of where resistance management fits, and it's important to the, to the overall organization. Um, by the way, committed to zero means zero safety incidents. That's something that comes from our 200-year pass as, as a gunpowder producer. So I wanted to summarize by uh, uh, letting you know, as you very well know, that uh, diamides are becoming a very important group of insecticides. Uh, DuPont is working very seriously on uh, diamide resistance management. We are fostering collaboration with other companies, and I have to say that that collaboration has been great. Everybody is really involved and focused on, on prolonging the life of these, co these uh, compounds because we believe that the benefits that they bring to growers are huge in terms of safety and efficacy, and uh, we should not waste them by, uh, by uh, using them in an appropriate fashion. So, I would like to end by thanking all the people that are involved in resistance management from technical to uh, um, extension advisors to, to agronomists to the growers, especially to the growers because I believe the resistance management starts with the growers and it's the growers' responsibility to um, really take up the message, which is very simple. It's rotate, rotate, rotate. Thank you.